Good morning. The uh, subcommittee will come to order. We are having a hearing today on a number of um, issues related to fish hatcheries, and I want to thank all the uh, witnesses and the members uh, this morning for coming to testify. Um, this is uh, uh, a good time for this kind of legislation, given the budget constraints and all the problems that the nation is facing, foreign and domestic. Um, we don't want to lose sight of some of the pieces that make this country great, and one of those pieces is understanding the nature of, of uh, the marine ecology <clears throat> and how we can continue to contribute to that, uh, reclaim and restore some of the nation's uh, streams and rivers and lakes and coastal areas. Part of that is fish hatcheries. And so the idea that we can partner and blend these uh, beautiful facilities and in some cases, in fact, let them be taken over by states who have some of the best expertise in this field, all the better. And this morning, our first witness is um, uh, Mr. Boucher, and we welcome you here this morning, Rick, and we look forward to your testimony, and you may begin. Well, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. I appreciate your inviting my testimony before your committee this morning. Uh, and I want to extend my thanks also to Ranking Member Pallone for his hospitality. Uh, I am here this morning in order to testify in support of uh, a bipartisan bill that I've introduced along with my Virginia colleague, Mr. Good. Uh, it is H.R. 5061. Our bill would simply convey two federal fish hatcheries that are located in the towns of Withville and Paint Bank in my congressional district to the state of Virginia. Virginia is operating those two hatcheries today, and uh, Virginia would be able to continue its operation of those hatcheries uh, once title to the facilities uh, is transferred to the state. The uh, legislation enjoys wide support, support. I'm aware of no opposition to the bill, and the bill has been endorsed by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, as well as by the state of Virginia, uh, both of which believe that the, the conveyance of these properties to the state from the federal government would be in the public interest. As I indicated, the two facilities are currently operated by the Virginia Department of Game and Inland Fisheries, and they have been since 1983, pursuant to a 25-year lease that was entered into between the federal government and the state of Virginia in that year. Back in the early 1980s, the federal government uh, was in the process of divesting some federal hatcheries that were not needed in order to mitigate, it, to mitigate depleted fish stocks. Uh, both of these hatcheries uh, fall into the category of breeding fish for recreational purposes only. Uh, they produce uh, brown trout, rainbow trout, and brook trout uh, and they stock these fish on the numerous streams that we have on federal lands in the western part of Virginia. In 1983, Virginia expressed interest in operating the facilities under a 25-year lease agreement, and the state has been, in fact, operating the facilities since that time. That lease is set to expire in 2008, and all of the interested parties believe that it is in the public interest for a conveyance of these facilities to take place to the state of Virginia prior to the expiration of that lease. Since beginning operation of the facilities, the state has made a number of investments in both of these hatcheries. With regard to the Withful facility, Virginia has invested approximately $159,000. With regard to the Paint Bank facility, the state has invested approximately $230,000 and with these funds, a number of improvements to both of these facilities have been made. Both facilities have been thoroughly tested for the presence of contaminants, and uh, no evidence of contaminants uh, at either facility has been found. Uh, our bill would simply transfer title of the Withful and Paint Bank hatcheries to the state of Virginia, a move that is endorsed by all interested parties. I appreciate the opportunity to testify this morning. I have a more lengthy statement, which I'll submit to you for the record. Uh, and I very much hope it will be your pleasure to report H.R. Uh, 5061. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Boucher. 
we, all of us will be happy to expedite this legislation. Uh, we're joined by Mr. Pallone, and uh, he may have uh, an opening statement or some questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an opening statement, but I don't want to hold uh, my colleague from Virginia up. I don't know if uh, do you want to have any questions of him or if I not. I think uh, uh, Mr. Boucher explained to us his legislation, so I, I don't have any further questions for him. And uh, no. Mr. Pallone, Mr. Kine? I don't want to hold them up. <laughs> well, thank you all very much. Good to be with you this morning. Yes, thank you, Rick. Our second panel is Dr. Mamie Parker, Assistant Director, Fish and Habitat Conservation, U U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And uh, Ms. Parker is accompanied by um, Marvin Moriarty, Regional Director, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Welcome to both of you this morning. Mr. Uh, Chairman, I was going to try to do my opening now oh, before they started, if you that know, was all uh, right. Sure, I'll, I'll uh, uh, if, if you just um, bear with us for a, a minute or two, Mr. Pallone will uh, enter his statement into the record. Mr. Pallone, or you'll say your statement into the record. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Our national fish hatchery system is often an overlooked and underappreciated federal asset, but as many sport anglers uh, will tell you, were it not for the hatchery system, many of our nation's rivers and streams would no longer provide sports fishing opportunities for millions of Americans. And I want to commend the chairman for holding this second hearing regarding our federal fish hatcheries, and I support his efforts to raise awareness about the system and the demands, demands placed upon it. I also support Mr. Saxon's legislation, H.R. 5381, the National Fish Hatchery System Volunteer Act, in this day and age when federal budget deficits are squeezing program budgets, volunteers provide an ins indispensable source of free labor and expertise, and we can only hope that this legislation will produce the same kind of success enabled by the passage of Mr. Saxon's National Wildlife Refuge Volunteer Act, another bill. Now, on the to topic of refugees, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to address something that has come to my attention that raises questions about the credibility of the U.S. Fish and Li Wildlife Service and the intentions of this administration. On May 10th, this subcommittee held a hearing on three bills affecting the national wildlife refugees, in particular legislation introduced by Congressman Paul Kanjorski, H.R. 5232, which would direct the Fish and Wildlife Service to evaluate the potential for establishing a new wildlife refuge in Pennsylvania and Congressman Spencer Bacchus's bill, H.R. 4947, regarding the expansion of the Cahoba, Cahaba National Wildlife Refuge in Alabama. During that hearing, the service's representative testified that the present operations and maintenance budget constraints facing the refuge system prevent the administration from supporting either the creation of any new refugees or the expansion of existing ones. The service is apparently even drawing up plans to close them close refuges to public use because the budget situation has become so dire. And that's why I was so surprised to hear the service announce earlier this week the administrative establishment of a new 25,000 acre, I don't know how to pronounce it, Neches, Neches River National Wildlife Refuge in Texas. I'd like to know how the service intends to explain this apparent 180 degree policy reversal. What happened to the operations and maintenance budget constraints? What does this announcement mean for the closing of other national wildlife refuges in New Jersey, Maryland, Wisconsin, or other states? And Mr. Chairman, I'm concerned that perhaps the service has not been too straightforward with this subcommittee. Our national wildlife refugees comprise the preeminent system of federal lands devoted to the protection and conservation of fish and wildlife. Over its 100-year history, the refuge system has benefited from bipartisan support to expand the system as necessary and appropriate. But neither branch has exclusive authority over the system. And I'm, I'm troubled, Mr. Chairman, that the administration might try to do so. And I suggest that this subcommittee exercise its oversight authority to immediately um, and directly question that presumption. Obviously, I'm bringing this up because our next panel uh, could hopefully uh, answer some questions in this regard, which I will get to you know, after the panel finishes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Pallone. Um, we are going to hold a hearing, and I thank uh, the gentleman from New Jersey for raising those issues because um, I believe in July, uh, July 20th, we'll hold a hearing on your concerns, and those are our concerns as well because they affect uh, refuges in my district. So we can ask the second panel some of those questions, but we'll 
have a comprehensive hearing on, on those issues. Thank you. Um, now I don't know if Mr. Kine, you had an opening statement? Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, I want to thank you for holding these hearings today, and I too would like to echo some uh, concern that my good friend from New Jersey just expressed as one of the founding co-chairs of the newly formed bipartisan National Refuge Caucus uh, in the House of Representatives. We obviously want more information on this. We're looking forward to that hearing and hopefully getting a candid assessment from the agency, too, of what exactly is going on here. But today, you know, I want to just speak uh, in favor of the Fish Hatchery Volunteer Act. I'm an original co-sponsor with Representative Saxton. It is modeled after uh, Representative S uh, Saxton's successful uh, Refuge uh, Volunteer Act that was enacted in 1998, basically bringing the fish hatcheries up to speed with what the refuges have been able to tap into. And that's the incredible wealth of volunteer time and resources that the Friends of the Refuges and now the Friends of the Fish Hatcheries can bring to this uh, vital component uh, to our natural resources. I also want to especially welcome Dr. Mamie Parker uh, for her presence here today. She is not unfamiliar with the good work being done in my congressional district in western Wisconsin, having spent a little time there herself and having been up to the Genoa Fish Hatchery just last year for the uh, dedication uh, uh, and uh, uh, public event that we held there. It was great hosting her, and it was wonderful uh, seeing her back in the area again. But given the challenges that we're facing, Mr. Chairman, on so many fronts, I mean, we've got roughly a $245 million backlog in regards to projects affecting the fish hatcheries, uh, countless other challenges that we're facing. This legislation really does make sense. It is bipartisan. It does bring it up to speed with the success that we've seen throughout the years with the refuge system and the friends and the tremendous amount of energy and new ideas and resources that they bring to it. So I look forward to the panel's uh, discussion. Look forward to supporting the committee, and hopefully we can move this legislation forward in due order. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Kine. And, and uh, at this point, I ask unanimous consent that the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Peterson, is sit on the dais, and Mr. Peterson has a bill before us today. And I'll ask if you have any opening statement. Yes, I'd like to thank the chairman and the ranking member for the opportunity. Uh, chairman Gilchrist and my fellow colleagues, I'm pleased to come before you today to ask for your support of the Tylersville Fish Hatchery Conveyance Act H.R. 4957. The Pennsylvania Fish and Boating Commission has used this site since 1984 after the Fish and Wildlife Service put the facility in caretaker status. The Commission currently uses this site under an interagency lease agreement with the Fish and Wildlife Service to raise over 600,000 adult fish, nearly 14 percent of the state trout production annually. This production contributes an estimated 63 million to the state economy. The Fish and Wildlife Service fully supports the conveyance of the fish hatchery and views this collaboration as providing for the growing needs of recreational fisheries that benefit not just the state of Pennsylvania but the surrounding states as well. I want to thank the Fish and Wildlife Service first for enhancing the recreational opportunities in the state and second for their support over 20 year partnership with the Fish and Boat Commission. I hope that the transfer of the Tylersburg fish hatchery will only enhance the strong working relationship between the two agencies. During the two decades that the Pennsylvania Boat and Fish Commission has leased the site, they have invested more than $3 million to maintain and enhance the fishery operations. Once conveyed, the Commission plans to invest several million dollars more to improve the facility. Additionally, once the property has been transferred, the State will be eligible to apply for funds from the Fish and Wildlife Service Sports Fishing Restoration Program to further maintain and improve the facility at Tylersville. The bill I have introduced, which now you are now considering will allow Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission to continue to provide opportunities for recreational fishing that significantly contributes to the economy of Clinton County in my district and the state of Pennsylvania. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for your subcommittee's time and efforts on holding a hearing on this bill and hope that you will consider it favorably. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. Um, uh, Dr. Parker and your able assistant, Mr. Moriarty, welcome to Washington once again. And we look forward to your testimony. Thank you. You may begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I ask for unanimous consent that my full written testimony be placed in the record. Okay. Without objection. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I am Mamie Parker, the Assistant Director for Fisheries and Habitat Conservation at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. I do have here with me my counterpart, uh, Mr. Marvin Moriarty, who's also succeeded me as the Regional Director of the uh, Northeast Region in Hadley, Massachusetts. Uh, we thank you for the opportunity to present our testimony for the Department of the Interior on H.R. 5381, 
uh, the National Fish Hatchery System Volunteer Act of 2006, the HR 5061, uh, the Paint uh, Bank and Withville National Fish Hatcheries Conveyance Act, as well as HR 4957, the Tylersville Fish Hatchery Conveyance Act. Uh, first, I'd like to talk about the uh, Hatchery Volunteer Act, and I have a summary slide on uh, the PowerPoint up there. As you know, uh, the service uh, volunteers and our friends group, they play a vital role in helping us fulfill our mission uh, to continue to uh, protect, conserve, and enhance fish and wildlife, plants, and habitat uh, for the continuing benefit of the American public. Um, this bill will certainly help us do that. Uh, in many cases, volunteers uh, provide essential services that we do not have uh, resources or staff to provide ourselves. And we've seen a great example of that, Mr. Chairman, uh, in the uh, 1998 uh, bill itself that was passed um, by the national, uh, for the National Wildlife Refuge System. Uh, prior to passing that uh, Refuge Volunteer Act, we had just a little over 4,000 volunteers donating about 128,000 uh, hours of service. Uh, after that act was passed, we have over 34,000 volunteers now, and they contribute over 1.2 million hours of service. In addition, over the last two years, volunteers completed more than 20% of the work on our National Wildlife Refuges, and their contributions have saved the refuge system over $28 million. So, we see the value of this act and therefore believe that it will certainly help the National Fish Hatchery System uh, by supporting operation and maintenance of our facilities, increasing the awareness in uh, the outdoor classrooms. Uh, that's something that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, I've said before, as Maya Angelou says, when you learn, teach, when you get, give, and then pass it on. And we really believe that our facilities could do more if we had more opportunities and had more folks helping us along the way. Uh, this uh, bill will also allow us to receive contributions from our partner organizations uh, for the exclusive benefit of our specific facilities rather than a general uh, fund. And finally, it would receive, uh, allow us to receive the donation of net revenues from the sale of many of those educational products that we talked about earlier. Having the opportunity of working on three national fish hatcheries in my 28-year history in the Fish and Wildlife Service, including one in Mr. Kine's district, the uh, Genoa National Fish Hatchery, and including one hatchery that was closed, uh, actually transferred to the state, the uh, New London, Minnesota National Fish Hatchery, I'm aware of the value of our uh, volunteers. Without them, we would not be where we are. They want to give back to the communities. They are uh, of all ages, and they learn more about conservation themselves when they work on our facilities. They enjoy the outdoors, and they want to spread the word around to the American public. A songwriter says that in good times and in bad times, we'll be on your side forevermore because that's what friends are for. And we believe that this act will certainly, this act will certainly help us and give our system more of an opportunity to have volunteers to give back to us in good times and in bad times. It will not only help our national fish hatchery system, but also our other fisheries resource offices as well. Um, we know that from the work that we've uh, seen with the National Wildlife Refuge that these volunteers uh, will provide a variety of tasks such as providing information to the visiting public, leading hatchery tours, conducting surveys and habitat improvements. Um, I want to move on now and talk a little bit about the hatchery transfers. Uh, since 1970, the service closed or turned over over 41 fish hatcheries uh, to the states and other entities. Uh, this was necessitated because we had to set some priorities. And because of those priorities, we stopped doing a lot of things, but we wanted to make sure that those things got done by our partners. And we shifted those responsibilities uh, to our state partners because we care about recreational fishing too in the service. So we support both of those bills because we believe that they will help us to continue to uh, enhance and support the national uh, fish hatchery system as well as help our state partners uh, realize some of the things that they need to do in terms of capital improvement. In closing, I'd like to say again, we support the bill. 
uh, and we'll certainly be there to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Parker. Um, Mr. Pallone, any questions? I want to just ask about these um, lease agreements um, with Pennsylvania and Virginia versus, you know, a transfer of title. What was the original rationale for signing a 25-year lease agreements or these agreements with the states of Pennsylvania and Virginia for the operation of Paint Bank, Tylersville, and Wytheville National Fish Hatcheries? And what is the current financial value of the land buildings and infrastructure that comprises these three hatchery facilities? I mean, my idea is to try to find out, um, you know, why we're moving to transfer of title. Is there has anyone conducted a fair market value assessment of the property since the first lease was signed? Will the state be, uh, states be allowed to convey excess property not essential to hatchery operations? Those are some of the questions. Okay, I'll start with the one about the original intent. Uh, 25 years ago, uh, or over 20 years ago, when we did transfer these facilities, it was because we were going through times like we're going through now, budget uh, reduction, downsizing, uh, required us to focus our program and to look for the priorities and to focus our resources on those priorities, as you've spoken earlier about the National Wildlife Refuge System. And because of that, we had to sit down with our partners and talk about shared responsibilities allowing them to take on some of the responsibilities that we once had and also allowing us to take on other responsibilities that our states uh, felt were important. And uh, that's why we did it. Um, in terms of the financial value of the buildings, um, the land and the infrastructure, we will have to get back to you with a specific number on that. We've gotten some estimates that is somewhere between eight and 12 a million dollars in terms of the value, but we're going to have our uh, real estate people to get back to uh, to you to answer specifically uh, what that means. Um, now I'd like to turn it over to uh, Marvin uh, Moriarty. He may have something to add. What I'm trying to get at basically too, you know, because I might as well throw this all in, what are the advantages of transferring title rather than just extending the current lease? In other words, is, is the service just trying to dispose of unwanted assets or, or is the justification that these hatcheries can be more effectively managed by the states? Because after all, the states spent millions of dollars to maintain, repair, and upgrade the hatchery facilities even though they were only being leased. So, you know, they've made those investments without a legal title. You know, why is it necessary to, to move to, uh, away from the lease arrangement now? Uh, yes, Congressman. Uh, I think the best way to, to state this is that uh, when the lease agreements were first made uh, some 20 years ago, uh, both the Fish and Wildlife Service and the states realized that providing fisheries benefits to the public was larger than just each of us. And we needed to form partnerships to provide those benefits, and the service decided that it better served the public in dealing with endangered species and interjurisdictional fish and mitigation type of hatcheries. The states were far better able to provide the large amounts of fish and the expertise to put recreational fish into the streams. And so this, these hatcheries fit that bill very well. I think at the time, the, the idea of a lease was probably the same as it would be today. The service is not uh, thrilled about giving up hatcheries. Uh, and I think at the time, they thought that it would be best to try the, the lease agreement first to see if this this arrangement would work. And I can only say that the, work, the arrangement has worked very, very well. The Pennsylvania Boat and Fish Commission and the Virginia Commission of Game and Inland Fisheries are both tremendous partners with the Fish and Wildlife Service in delivering fisheries benefits to the public. And their, their management of these facilities has, has been tremendous. Now, as far as why we would want to go forward with the transfer, uh, it's been clear that uh, the messages that uh, the states, uh, our state partners have been getting is that while the legislatures in the states are willing to provide maintenance funding and some minor uh, improvement funding for those hatcheries. Uh, they would much rather see those, those hatcheries, the facilities in fee within the state. They would have much better uh, uh, potential for getting funding uh, through the state legislatures if the, if the hatcheries were in fee. So this is one of the reasons why the Fish and Wildlife Service supports the, the passage of the bill. And then is it possible, though, that, um, I mean, I know you said you're going to get back to us on the fair market value and all that, but, I mean, is it, are the states looking to convey excess property, or you think that they're just, this is just a question of their having this so that they can spend more money on infrastructure and improvements? Uh, 
Okay, go ahead. Uh, I think I, I know that it's from talking to the states, uh, we have some representatives here, it's so that they can assure their legislators and others that they can make those investments uh, themselves. Um, I also want to mention that we do have a reversionary clause in, in these transfers that basically will say that if uh, the states will not be utilizing these properties to do fish culture work, that they will revert back to the federal government and Fish and Wildlife Service uh, to decide whether or not we want to continue to do work because we have um, some other priorities too. So it's not going to be excess property. Okay, that's important. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, again, I want to thank uh, your testimony here today as well as your support for the uh, Fish Hatchery Volunteer Act. I think it is an important piece of legislation. Mamie, I want to thank you again for all that you did in, during the Genoa Fish Hatchery. They have a wonderful team in place right now with Doug Aloesi and the rest of the staff that you witnessed personally last year when you came in for a visit. Uh, I do have a question, however, and that is uh, in light of what we see in current budgetary times, and this is tough. This has been real tough for the National Park Service, another 20 percent cut being proposed that's going to affect real services and personnel, uh, the severe strain that the refuge system is under right now with the backlog of maintenance and repair and habitat protection, the tight budget that the fisheries are having to operate under as well, that this legislation is something out of necessity because the traditional role of government and being able to provide resources for these type of services and programs and maintenance is diminishing uh, every year with the cutbacks that we're seeing. Yet there is a huge untapped potential out there that I see, again, with an aging population, with more of our uh, aging citizens being able to travel, visit the parks, visit the refuges, stop by and visit the fish hatcheries, of whether or not we can think more creatively in our outreach program to introduce the Friends program to more people. Obviously, if you're directly involved in it or if you live in the locality and you're familiar with uh, the tremendous uh, value that parks, refuges, fisheries bring to the area, it's self-evident. But there are a lot of people who aren't exposed to that uh, on a day-to-day -day uh, uh, basis. And I'm wondering if you're familiar whether the services looking into this or if you're familiar with other work that's being done as far as a more proactive marketing campaign to introduce more people to the opportunities of volunteerism, contribution, those type of services with the fisheries. Uh, but this ob obviously also relates to the, to the Friends of the Refuge system too. Uh, yes, Mr. Client, uh, Mr. Kind, uh, we are aware of that. And in fact, you mentioned aging populations. I feel like I'm one of those too and look mm -hmm. forward to the chance to to uh, work as a volunteer on a national fish hatchery. Um, we have a strategic plan that we just finished recently. And in that strategic plan, we have goals to increase the number of friends groups throughout the entire system. In fact, we're proposing to double the numbers that we have now. And that effort is, is certainly been put in the strategic plan because we realize that we need friends and other volunteers to help us do the work. We're also working really closely with refuges because we don't want to reinvent the wheel right. uh, to figure out ways to enhance that. Uh, outreach has become a, one of our number one priorities in the fisheries program, uh, and I think it will continue to help us uh, go out there and find some people that will support our system. Uh, finally, there's a, there's a section in the act that talks about a pilot program that will allow us to recruit um, more people uh, to see what's, what works and what doesn't work so we can develop some best management practices uh, to help us recruit friends groups. That's great. And, you know, with your permission, I'd like to have Mark and my staff just follow up with you on the strategic plan that you've uh, come out with so we can track it and perhaps do what we can to assist in that endeavor. I think it's going to be vitally important unless things turn around as far as the priorities of our nation and more support is being given. Uh, to the fisheries and the refuges. I think these friends groups are going to be even more and more important as we move forward. And I think if we can increase the numbers and level of participation, this has tremendous opportunities and potential, and it's, it's very exciting. So we'll follow up with you. Okay. Right. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.
We will provide it for the committee. Uh, we are aware that several uh, national fish hatcheries that are being currently operated on the other MOUs and, and MOAs, uh, that will expire in the next couple of years, in fact, uh, somewhere around five of those. Uh, to in total, we're still trying to get that number, but we believe that it's somewhere around 40 that, uh, that, that we're working with right now. Um, we have some that are going to expire in the next couple of years, but we have several that are also uh, will expire in the year 2021. So it varies in terms of, of, of the number of years that these leases are, are out there. Thank you very much. Uh, now, Mr. Pallone for other questions. Thank you. I just wanted to ask a couple more things, uh, maybe, or maybe Marvin, one of the two of you. Are there any other environmental contaminant problems at any of these, uh, are there any environmental contaminant problems at any of these three hatcheries, and who's legally responsible for cleaning up um, if this legislation passes? Mr. Congressman, uh, there was a contaminant issue of uh, asbestos at the two Virginia hatcheries, which was remediated. Uh, we found out about that, sought the funding to uh, remediate it, and it was completed in uh, FY 2005. Uh, also, prior to the transfer of the hatcheries, the service is required by its internal uh, procedures to do a contaminant survey for all the lands that are to be transferred. And if there are any additional contaminants activities going on on any of those hatcheries, we will know about it. The guess is not, because we've, uh, we've taken a thorough look at them before. But again, we will take another. But what happens after they're transferred if, you know, later something's found? Well, let's, if we, well, well, first of all, we'll find it before they're transferred. And the, then we will go through the procedures necessary to ensure that we transfer a contaminant-free hatchery. Oh, so you're not worried there's a possibility that something comes up later after it's transferred? Uh, no, sir. Oh, you're very confident. If you were in New Jersey with some of these at a Superfund site, you wouldn't be so confident, but okay. <laughs> um, as far as the volunteers are concerned, um, what's the Fish and Wildlife Service's current legal authority relative to volunteers uh, within the hatchery system, and how many friends of hatchery organizations are there? Do you have information on that, where they're located? Yes, uh, we do. Uh, the authority that we're using now was uh, the Fish and Wildlife Act of 1956. Uh, that allows us to do some uh, do the work that we do in terms of volunteers. Uh, in addition, we have some departmental guidance. We have some appropriations bill that authorize funds to for us to award and recognize our volunteers. We're also using the uh, the uh, refuge system volunteer and community um, partnership act too to help us and guide us um, in ways in which we um, work closely with our volunteers. In terms of friends groups, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have about 18 formally established friends groups. Uh, there are a number of them that are, that are not established, but 18 <coughs> in great places. And you're going to hear from some of those folks in the next panel from our D.C. Booth uh, National Fish Hatchery in South Dakota, as well as uh, Neosho, Missouri uh, uh, Hatchery. And, uh, and then again, our White Sulphur Springs Hatchery. Those are some of the the, the shining stars in our system uh, right now, and they're leading the way and helping us as we establish new facilities, uh, new friends groups throughout the country. I'm going to put my legal hat on here. If, if the volunteers, unfortunately, were injured at one of our federal hatcheries, how are, how is that treated in terms of compensation for their medical bills? That's a, that's a good question. Uh, having worked on, on, as I said, three national fish hatcheries, one of the things I want to make clear is that we treat our volunteers just like their employees. And, uh, and in doing so, we make sure that they do not feel like they are visitors there, that they actually belong there. And um, because of that, we also have uh, them covered under the Federal Employee Compensation Act. And so if any of them are injured, uh, they get the same benefits and rights that uh, our employees that are on our facilities will get. Do you have any information about the, the number of individual volunteers at, at one or more of the hatcheries or, you know, how many hours do they volunteer, you know, what does that add up to in terms of uh, man or woman hours? 
Yes, in fact, uh, I did get a number just recently uh, from uh, Stuart Leon, who's our chief of our national fish hatchery system. He's been here about six months now, and uh, he shared with me that um, we've totaled about 60, uh, if we collectively look at uh, many of our facilities and where we have friends groups uh, and volunteers, we're talking about somewhere around six, 60 staff hours of, of time uh, for that, that volunteers actually contribute. 60 people is what we're getting in return for the volunteer work. I don't have an estimate on the, the, the dollar amount, but I could get that for you. Okay. All right, thanks a lot, I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm, uh, first of all, let me apologize for uh, being so tardy. Um, uh, Staff tells me that uh, you've already talked about the maintenance backlog, so um, uh, I, when uh, we adopted the uh, statute uh, permitting the refuge system to use volunteers, one of the reasons for that was our constant, the constant attention that we had to pay to the, back, to the maintenance back, backlog and uh, and we were hopeful that the uh, volunteer program and the refuge system would, would help with that problem. Uh, has, has it helped at all with, uh, with, with regard to the maintenance backlog? Uh, it, from the refuge perspective, it certainly has helped. And we've, uh, we've found that uh, because of the support that we've gotten from volunteers uh, uh, from, since 1998, uh, we're talking about over $28 million that we've actually been able to uh, say uh, that we've saved in the system because we've had volunteers there to do a lot of the work. And that's certainly the case, uh, Mr. Saxon, for uh, the National Fish Hatchery System. Uh, our backlog in terms of maintenance is well over $200 million. Uh, we have a backlog in, in operations, too, and we have a wonderful system uh, uh, that will show what that backlog looks at, like in terms of our operational needs. And uh, we're certain that with the, this act, if it's passed, that we can uh, certainly uh, use some of the volunteers and increase the number of volunteers to help us do some of that, that work that's in, in, in terms of maintenance. Well, that's good news. Thank you very much. Thanks for being with us today. We appreciate Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Fortunato? All right. Well, any, in any event, as I started to say, thank you for being with us today. We appreciate it very much, and uh, we look forward to working with you as we go forward. Thank you for your support, sir. Thank you. We're going to move now to our third and final panel, uh, Mr. Douglas Austin, Executive Director, Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission. Mr. Mer Gary Martell, Director of Fisheries, Virginia Department of Game and Inland Fisheries. Ms. Kay Hively, a friend of Nisho Fishery, National Fish Hatchery, and the Honorable John Bowling, friends of uh, White Sulphur Springs National Fish Hatchery, and Mr. Eric T. Davis, Executive Director, Booth Society, Inc. Thank you all for uh, being with us today. We appreciate your participation. And uh, Mr. Austin, why don't we start with you and just work our way across the table there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. It's a pleasure to be here this morning and uh, be down here in D.C. I'm, as you mentioned, Dr. Douglas Austin. I'm director of the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission. I want to thank you for this opportunity to discuss the transfer of the Tylersville Fish Hatchery from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission, as provided for in Congressman Peterson's uh, bill, House Resolution 4957 the Tylersville Fish Hatchery Conveyance Act. The Commission supports this bill and its provisions to convey to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania without reimbursement within 180 days after enactment all right title and interest to the United States in the federal fish hatchery located at Tylersville. The fish hatchery is located about seven miles east of Lamar in Clinton County, Pennsylvania along Big, Big Fishing Creek, a beautiful place to visit. If you're ever in our area, we'd love to have you uh, join us and be happy to take you out fishing as well. It was originally constructed in 1963 by the Department of Interior, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to support federal lands trout stocking program. The commission began leasing the hatchery from the service in about 1983. Tylersville is now an integral part of the Commonwealth's trout hatchery program. 
for more than 20 years has had a tremendous impact on the fishing opportunities the Commission has been able to provide to our citizens. Pennsylvania is known nationwide and worldwide, in fact, for trout fishing in 2006. Tylersville stocked nearly 600,000 adult trout throughout 12 counties. Based on these latest stocking numbers, Tylersville produces approximately 14 percent of the adult trout stocked by the Commonwealth in Pennsylvania. These plantings of trout contribute a substantial economic benefit to this rural part of Pennsylvania. The total economic impact of fishing in Pennsylvania is estimated at about $1.6 billion. The Commission is in the process of adjusting these numbers based on uh, the hatchery input. Uh, we estimate roughly that the facility at Tylersville generates roughly $63 million of economic impact through fish stocking in the Commonwealth. The facility itself at Tylersville has an operating budget of about $950,000, a workforce of 12 permanent employees and one seasonal employee. And this employment and the operations of this facility in this rural part of Pennsylvania is unquestionably a significant part of an impact on this rural economy. The Commission, as, as was mentioned by several people, including Congress, Congressman Peterson earlier, has made substantial investments in maintaining the infrastructure at Tylersville. From 1991 through 2005, the Commission has invested more than $2 million in infrastructure improvements and upgrades. These improvements have included the development of new fish rearing units, improvements to the effluent system through the construction of clarifier unit and polishing ponds, improvement to the influent water through control structures and monitoring equipment, and enhancement of oxygen in injection through liquid oxygen systems. Currently, in fact, right now, we're in an, another phase of construction that's uh, investing $1.72 million into a wastewater treatment upgrade to meet revised Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection National Pollution Discharge Elimination Permit Systems, NPDS, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. This upgrade will ensure that the hatchery will play an important role in the Commission's trout, trout stocking and trout fishing program for many years to come. The Tylersville Fish Hatchery is a key component supporting Pennsylvania's recreational trout fishing opportunities and economic activity for trout fishing provides in the Commonwealth. We support and hope that you will also support the transfer of Tylersville to the Fish and Boat Commission. The transfer is supported by our commissioners so that the commission can have long-term security and continuing to invest in the facility in making these improvements. The commission has and will continue to invest in the facility. The security that this transfer allows will continue to provide us a, a significant part of uh, continuing with this effort and is a critical part of this program. While lease, uh, lease arrangement has worked over the past years, it's been our understanding and intent that the facility would in fact be transferred. The question has come up about uh, the role of that and it's been made clear to us by our state authorities, our Department of General Services and our legislatures that conveyance of title is a critical part of continuing these improvements. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, thank you again for the opportunity to testify. I want to emphasize that the parties involved all agree that conveyance of Tylersville is reasonable, will provide benefits for both the state and federal partners, and will not have any negative impacts upon either of the parties. The conveyance is important to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania to, and is essential in enabling us to continue our trout stocking opportunities and impact that they generate for the economy. We've been working closely with the Fish and Wildlife Service for many, many years. Uh, Congressman Peterson's staff has been exceptional to work with, as well as Senator Santorum, who I'll be meeting with this afternoon as well, uh, working on a companion bill for this. I want to express that the Commission staff at all levels have enjoyed this relationship uh, with the service over 20 years and regard this operation of the hatchery and the sharing of the uh, facility and expertise as, as an integral part of a very positive working relationship. The partnership will continue through this transfer in a very real way with uh, many other Fish and Wildlife Service facilities, as well as the staff that they provide. With that, I'll close my statement and be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Austin. Uh, Mr. Martell. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I'm Gary Martell, Director of Fisheries for the Virginia Department of Game and Inland Fisheries. I appreciate you providing me the opportunity to present testimony for our department regarding H.R. 5061. The Withville National Fish Hatchery located in Wythe County, Virginia, and the Paint Bank National Fish Hatchery located in Craig County, Virginia, have been operated by our department under a no-cost 25-year lease agreement since March of 1983. Prior to 1983, these facilities were operated by the United States Fish and Wildlife Service to provide trout for recreational fishing on federal properties in Virginia and in neighboring states. 
When given an option between closure and operational transfer, we elected to take over the facilities and continue to provide recreational angling opportunity for our constituents on federal, state, and private waters in Western Virginia. Our department has incorporated the two hatcheries into our system, and currently they're producing approximately 40 percent of the trout stock for public fishing in Virginia. The estimated economic impact of recreation provided by the stock trout from these two facilities is over $40 million a year. And following Dr. Or during Dr. Austin's uh, presentation, I was doing the figures, and actually, somewhat amazingly, I think if you do the the figure per fish and per fisherman, they're very similar. So it, it really is big business, brings a tremendous amount of revenue and economic impact uh, to, our, to our rural areas. Uh, the facilities which are located in the rural areas are actually providing direct employment in Virginia for 13 employees. We began working with the service in 1995 to convey ownership of the two hatcheries to Virginia. Both of our agencies have been supportive of the transfer for more than a decade. The option of a renewed memorandum or a no-cost lease is not as desirable as both hatcheries are aging and in need of significant capital investment. Modernization and expansion of Paint Bank and Withville are part of our agency's current long-term plan for Virginia's hatchery system. Transfer of the facilities is needed in order for significant capital investment to occur by, by our agency. To date, we have provided repair and improvement funding to the facilities at a cost of almost $400,000. Our department has continued to provide trout eggs upon request to federal and state hatcheries throughout the country. The hatchery at Paint Bank is unique in that it's one of the, uh, the few certified disease-free hatcheries in the country. And the service provides us with disease testing at all of our facilities in exchange for certified eggs. Passage of HR 5061 will have no cost impact on the state and federal budgets. Passage will, however, provide for the continued operation and improvement of these two important facilities. An independent consultant was contracted by our agency in 1995 to make system-wide recommendations and estimated costs of renovations and upgrades. The estimates in today's dollars for the needed renovations at the two hatcheries is placed approximately four and a half million dollars. We strongly support the transfer as proposed in HR 5061. Transfer of paint bank and withville to our department will ensure long-term recreational angling opportunities for trout in the western portion of Virginia and continued operation of the facilities to provide both trout and trout eggs to state and federal op hatcheries around the country. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to thank you and the committee for providing our department the opportunity to speak on this important legislation. We also would like to recognize the services efforts over the past several years in working to facilitate the transfer Certainly, Congressman Boucher and Goode for introducing the legislation and supporting the transfer. If you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate uh, both of your uh, being here this morning, both of you being here this morning. And also, um, we're, uh, we're informed that, uh, that both the federal agencies and the state agencies in each of your cases are in agreement and uh, just waiting for the Congress to pass the necessary legislation. And so hopefully we'll, uh, we'll move in that direction as expeditiously as, uh, as possible. So thank you for being here with us. We appreciate it. Now we're going to hear from uh, what we call friends groups. And we'll begin with Ms. Hively. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, it's a, a great privilege to speak on behalf of the American volunteer. I am an American volunteer. I'm a volunteer for the Neosho National Fish Hatchery but while I'm a volunteer, I'm also a friend, not only to the hatchery in my hometown of Neosho, Missouri, but to all 86 fish hatcheries, fish health centers, fish technology centers, and our historic national fish hatchery. I was first drawn to my local hatchery because I'm a historian. The Neosho National Fish Hatchery is the oldest operating fish hatchery in the United States, having been established in 1888. Its colorful history is what first caught my attention. But once I took an interest in the hatchery, I learned much more than history. I came to appreciate the great work that is done by hatchery employees on behalf of my country. My involvement increased in the early 80s when the federal budget restraints threatened to close my hatchery. At that time, the friend in me was born, and I fought long and hard to save my hatchery. In the year 2001, the Friends of the Neosho National Fish Hatchery was created. We now have a membership of 63. 
Although we are a small band, we are a mighty band. In the few years of our existence, we have provided goods and services that were beyond the reach of the local hatcheries budget and manpower. We have purchased a small piece of land to protect a natural spring that provides vital water to our hatchery. We have provided 190 new fishing rods and reels and safety glasses for volunteers and children in this year's annual kids fishing derby. We have secured highway signs leading to the hatchery. We built a big new picnic shelter on the hatchery grounds. We have cleaned and repaired an historic structure which sits on the grounds of our equally historic hatchery. We maintain flower beds, we conduct an annual open house, and we work hundreds of man hours each year doing many jobs which could not be funded by taxpayer monies. Almost since our founding, our group has longed to work with the other 17 friends groups and with friends groups yet to come. We believe that our future efforts will be even greater if we can interact with others who share the same challenges we face. Over the past five years, I have attended several friends meetings, but often I am the lone representative of a fish hatchery. I look forward to the day when every hatchery has a friends group and we can all live together, not only to help our local hatcheries, but to serve our country. Strong friends groups can have a positive impact on the national fish hatchery system by providing monetary contributions, physical labor, and moral support. As a historian, newspaper editor, and a citizen of 60 plus years, I have learned and seen how great America is. I fully understand that I owe a debt to my country. Through my work as a friend, I am able to make payments on that debt. I hope you will give me the tools necessary to make even larger payments. I ask that you please support the establishment of even more fish hatchery friends groups so we can apply the philosophy of strength in numbers. I plea for a mandate which gives fish hatcheries the opportunity to establish friends groups which can band together to provide even greater service to the American people. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the honor of speaking on behalf of all the volunteers who assist our national fish hatcheries. Thank, well, thank you. Your uh, enthusiasm, I'm sure, is contagious. Uh, I, I, I hope can, so. Very good. And We're I not going to appreciate your efforts in introducing the bill. Thank you. Uh, we're now going to hear from the Honorable John Bowling, who uh, I understand is a former state senator. So thank you for being with us, sir, and we'll go ahead and uh, let you give your testimony at this point. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I am John Bowling, Jr., president of the Bowling's Home Center in White Sulphur Springs, West Virginia, a member of the White Sulphur Springs Rotary Club and friends of the White Sulphur Springs National Fish Hatchery. Thank you for the opportunity to present testimony regarding H.R. 5381, the National Fish Hatchery, System Volunteer Act. I have with me today my son, Admiral John Bowling III. Uh, his main reason for being here is to keep me from getting lost, old country boy from getting lost in the city. <laughs> the White Sulphur Springs National Peach Hatchery has served the city of White Sulphur Springs, the state of West Virginia, and the nation since the turn of the 20th century. For over 100 years, the hatchery has provided economic, recreational, and educational services to the community. Indeed, the people of our community view this hatchery as their hatchery. Many community members recall how they used to visit and play at the hatchery when they were young. And this was prior to becoming a litigious society, but during World War II, I remember the hatchery opening its grounds for picnics for church and civic organizations, and the big pond to local citizens for swimming in the summer and ice skating in the winter. Thus, our community has a sincere and vested interest in not only maintaining the operational integrity of the hatchery, but also enhancing the mission and role the hatchery plays in our city as a recreational and tourist attraction. The White Silver Hatchery is one of only three disease-free rainbow trout broodstock hatcheries in the country, responsible for shipping and producing eight million eggs per year. More recently, the hatchery expanded its role to include propagation and restoration of endangered freshwater mussels. Because of its location in the middle of downtown White Sulphur Springs and its proximity to freeway entrances into White Sulphur, the hatchery provides a unique tourism stop for thousands of visitors. Community members, such as myself, enjoy working with the hatchery in its mission to promote fishing and outdoor recreation in West Virginia. Over the years, the hatchery has partnered with and received support from community groups and citizens to accomplish its goal. For the past, past 15 years, our Rotary Club has co-hosted the annual fishing derby 
at the hatchery, which is attended annually by approximately 400 children and their family members. <coughs> in 2000, the Rotary Club played a major role in organizing and producing the hatchery's centennial celebration. And more recently, our Rotary Club and the newly formed Friends of White Sulphur Springs National Fish Hatchery partnered with the hatchery to produce the inaugural Freshwater Folk Festival. The festival was held on October the 7th, 2005, and was attended by over 1,000 visitors from our local and neighboring communities. I would like to report on a few of the activities that our Friends Group and Rotary Club would like to achieve, but have been unable to perform due to liability concerns for volunteers working at the hatchery and limitations to fund raising cap capabilities. These activities include a stream habitat restoration project on Wage Creek, which runs through the hatchery. This project will serve as a model of good stream habitat management practices and demonstration for landowners of how to restore a degraded stream. Upon obtaining the necessary funds for planning and implementing the project, hatchery personnel will help with volunteers will install interpretive signs to, dis to discuss the importance of stream habitat, restoration to quality, water quality, and describe the engineering phrase, phases of restoration effort. Additional projects we would like to implement at the hatchery include creating wetland habitat for migrating shorebirds, installing walking trails, and interpretive signs along the hatchery woodlands, and updating existing hatchery signs. Ultimately, the Rotarians, Friends, and the City of White Sulphur Springs would like to partner with the hatchery to create a cooperative visitor center focused on the cultural and natural heritage of Appalachia that would include an outdoor aquarium of Appalachians where visitors could walk and observe the life of the stream. And finally, support of this legislation would enable the Friends of White Sulphur Springs National Fish Hatchery, which the Rotary Club played a role in creating and continues to support, to take some of the duties that the Rotary Club has performed and move into new areas of interaction with the hatchery. The National Fish Hatchery System Volunteer Act would provide necessary infrastructure and support for encouraging volunteerism for the hatchery, as well as facilitate the ability of friends groups to raise and donate funds. The Hatchery Volunteer Act would aid in the development and viable partnership between non-government organizations and the U.S. Uh, Wildlife Service. Again, I, give, I thank you for the opportunity to appear before you. Thank you, sir. We appreciate you being here again. We're now going to go to Mr. Uh, Eric Davis of the <coughs> Booth Society, uh, gentleman from South Dakota. Yes. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I am Eric Davis, Executive Director of the Booth Society, a friends group at D.C. Booth Historic National Fish Hatchery in Spearfish, South Dakota. Thank you for the opportunity to present testimony today regarding H.R. 5381. The National Fish Hatchery System Volunteer Act would serve to create and enhance community partnerships increase volunteer efforts and allow partners to contribute financially to support the activities and mission of national fish hatcheries and other fisheries program offices. This bill would increase public awareness of the fisheries program's role in conserving and restoring America's fisheries and improve the ability of partner organizations to promote stewardship of those resources. The Booth Society is the oldest and largest nonprofit citizen-based fisheries friends group in the country and coordinates the largest volunteer and outreach program for fisheries. Our volunteers work to accomplish activities that the service cannot provide or is unable to fund. We increase public awareness of the services programs by promoting and marketing the hatchery, which has become one of the most popular visitor attractions in the northern Black Hills of South Dakota with over 150,000 annual visits. Volunteers at DC Booth donate over 14,000 hours each year to preserve and enhance our historic facility that is listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Booth Society volunteers support the service in their operations and create and enhance educational, cultural, and recreational opportunities by seeking grants, developing educational curriculums, <coughs> interpreting the history of the site for visitors, giving school tours, funding exhibits, and hosting events. While the volunteer program at DC Booth is strong, our vision is large and our staff is small. As executive director of this friends group, I have only a portion of my time to devote to our volunteers. Many of our community members are interested in volunteering their time and energy, but we lack the time and resources to expand our program and accommodate the interest from prospective <coughs> volunteers and supporters. We have worked with other fisheries program supporters around our region who are also eager to volunteer, but have no one to lead them or support their efforts. 
The Booth Society receives frequent requests from other stations on how to form friends groups and set up successful volunteer programs, but our resources limit our ability to extend a helping hand. The Hatchery Volunteer Act would allow a few pilot volunteer coordinator positions around the country that will enhance the development of volunteer services in the National Fish Hatchery System, a place where the public has shown they are eager to satisfy their desire to give something back to a fisheries program that has benefited its country and its citizens for so many years. The Refuge Volunteer Act helped to considerably broaden, increase, and enhance the Refuge Volunteer Program. Yet fledgling fisheries friends groups have been unable to receive adequate coordination assistance, startup funds, or training. I believe HR 5381 would provide the fuel needed to significantly increase volunteer services and provide increased support to the conservation of our nation's fisheries resources, just as it has so successfully within the National Wildlife Refuge System. As recently as five years ago, there were just a few fisheries friends groups across this country. The service now has 18 such groups out of 150 eligible facilities. The public is showing us that they are eager to become involved and partner with the service. In a time of waning federal resources to support conservation programs, we believe the government needs the help of its citizens who share the service's vision of working with partners to restore and maintain our natural resources and the people who value and depend on them. With this bill, we have the opportunity to show the public that we value and appreciate their support. The Hatchery Volunteer Act will provide the mechanism for the service to achieve its goals and save taxpayer dollars. The Booth Society, our partners, and the visitors we serve understand deeply the value of friends and of volunteers. Working together in partnerships, we have accomplished much more than any of us could have done individually. DC Booth has been faced with many challenges over the years, but is alive and well today because we have a model partnership that works and volunteers and a citizenry who care about DC Booth and the Fish and Wildlife Service's role in their community. Because we at DC Booth have seen such success with our partnerships and volunteer programs, we are anxious to share our model with other hatcheries and fisheries offices around the country and to realize the full potential of our own volunteer program and that of the other hatcheries around this country for the betterment of each individual facility and of the fisheries and habitat conservation program as a whole. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my prepared testimony. On behalf of the Booth Society Board of Directors, I would like to thank you and the rest of the subcommittee for your leadership and interest in the services fisheries program, the hatchery system, and all of us local citizens who want to volunteer our time and encourage others to do the same to the conservation of America's fisheries resources. I would be happy to respond to any questions that you might have. Thank you very much uh, for your uh, testimony. Mr. Pallone, do you have questions? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to ask a couple of questions, but before I do, uh, on behalf of our ranking Democrat, um, Mr. Uh, Ray Hall, I just wanted to thank John Bowling, um, who, is, who is the former mayor of White Sulphur Springs, West Virginia, uh, for traveling here today to testify. Um, and he is a true friend of the hatch, hatchery system. So on behalf of Mr. Ray Hall, I just wanted to thank you for being here today. Um, Two questions uh, for anyone on the panel. Uh, what types of activities are volunteers used for? Is it mostly visitor service activities or do they ever participate in the technical operations at a hatchery? And then secondly, what would be the overall benefits to the hatchery system should the enactment of this National Fish Hatchery System Volunteer Act come to pass? I know some of you have sort of touched on that, but if anybody wanted to, to follow up particularly on the issue of the types of activities and you know, whether they ever participate in technical operations. Well, I, I can say, uh, sure. Mr. Pallone, that uh, while I work at DC Booth and I'm employed by the Friends Group on my vacations, I like to travel down to Saratoga National Fish Hatchery in Wyoming and assist them in spawning fish. So occasionally volunteers, I know from personal experience, do assist in some technical operations, however, uh, meaning <coughs> Okay. We do not get into any technical uh, thing. It's basically uh, to benefit the recreational uh, uh, tourist attractions and so forth, but uh, we don't get involved in the technical. Okay. And Neil, shall we don't get technical, but uh, I just wish Mr. Kind were still here because uh, I'm familiar with Genoa and uh, the manager there is a former Neosho assistant manager. 
And I do know they do some technical work, the volunteers there. Uh, they go out in the river, one of the few places left that go out and actually net a wild fish and uh, take the, uh, the eggs there. And I know the friends help, help man the boats. They actually have to go out on the river in boats. And uh, I think they run the boats while the, while the biologists are out actually netting the fish. So there's some, and I think it depends on the way your hatchery is set up. We do some things that we like to think we support the technical work, but you know, I'm no scientist. I'm not going in the lab and cut one open and look at it in a microscope or anything. But, but oh, we do. We do support it every other way we can. All right, thanks. Anybody else? No. Anybody want to talk about the overall benefits? I guess your testimony has basically told us that, so we're fine. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Fortuno. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, as I take it, uh, regarding H.R. 4957 and H.R. 5061, there is indeed a consensus between the federal agencies and the state agencies. Uh, so if that's the case, I certainly hope that we'll be able to take the necessary steps to complete the uh, process, legislative process on our side of uh, the fence. Uh, I just wanted to make a comment, actually. I visited with a distinguished member of our, our uh, committee Mr. Young from Alaska, we visited a hatchery there. We're truly impressed by the work that done, uh, is done there and by the volunteer groups uh, that actually are supportive there. And I just wanted to commend the wonderful jo job that the volunteers uh, are doing uh, throughout uh, the system. I want to thank you for your service for the country and thank you for being here this morning. With that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you. Your testimony all five was great, and we appreciate you being here. And uh, we're going to uh, move forward with these measures as expeditiously as possible. So thank you for being here, and you've been a big help. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you. I have a feeling I'm being picked on. Uh-oh. <laughs> Oh, I'm Kay Hively. Nice to meet you. 